This is David Meltzer with Entrepreneurs, the Playbook. I have a mentor of mine, and also I consider him family now, Peter Tuckman. He's the Einstein of Wall Street. He's the most iconic stockbroker at the New York Stock Exchange. And most importantly, he's a mensch. This man is here to be of service and of value to everyone with something that's so important, financial literacy, understanding how we all can actually make a lot of money, help a lot of people, and have a lot of fun. He's been doing it for decades on the New York Stock Exchange. Welcome to the playbook, my friend, Peter. What's up, guys? It's so wonderful. So happy to be on the playbook with you and finally getting the time to be together. Amazing. Well, you know, I'm going to start somewhere different than most Wall Street people start. And it's with the importance of two things, gratitude and kindness. Um, and those two things are not usually spoken of when speaking about the New York Stock Exchange. But when you see Peter Tuckman on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, there is a collective consciousness. There is an energy, a frequency of gratitude amongst all the people on the floor. And most importantly to me, kindness. How important through your career in the most competitive, scarce, backstabbing, you know, capitalistic place on earth, can you thrive utilizing gratitude and kindness as your superpower? You know what? I love that. It is my superpower. And, you know, look, we, we could have talked about any number of things, you and I, and surely financial literacy is one of them and the stock market and everything, because it's obviously gotten everyone's focus lately. And it's surely a thing. It's the flavor of the moment as you would, uh, you would describe it. But, you know, for me to be in front of you and to become your friend, uh, I have to highlight the, the terms that we use and you use all the time, which is something that inspired me about you. It connected me to you was gratitude and kindness. Look, our, our worlds are all full of so much stuff. You know, look, we've got family and we've got money and we've got survival and we've got challenges and we've got high points and low points and whatnot. Everyone has a journey, right? And I think it's important for us to never presume that we know what the other person is experiencing. And one of the things that you do, and I know you've had your journey, your ups and your downs, and you've described it, spiritual highs and lows, financial highs and lows. But at the end of the day, look, at the end of the day, we, we really need to go forward with one premise only which is gratitude for where we are and how we can, it's not a matter of who dies with the most toys. And this is something that I, it's not my own. I didn't come up with it. And it's something that I was not my premise for living all through my journey too. As, as you, I've had my spiritual bottoms as well and I've come out of them and I've realized what's really important. But I think at the end of the day, it's how we can affect others in a positive way. That's our goal. So you and I can talk about financial literacy and promote that. And I think we should do it another time. I think that we're here in December, 2021. We're at 18 months into this pandemic. We're about to get, you know, as I track the news here at the Stock Exchange about what's going on with the pandemic and everyone's experience and whatnot. And as I sort of embark on a couple of new journeys within the NFT space where we're kind of embracing certain causes, mental illness being one of them, education being one of them. I'm also seeing that you know, I think it was I, I think it was the Surgeon General the other day said that we are about to uh, uh, embark on uh, a, a new pandemic and that will be mental illness. You know, we've been locked down for look, you and I have really blessed lives and we've had bottoms and tops and whatnot. And we're sort of coming out of a lot of that. And we've embraced the joy and kindness, which is one which is your your uh, uh, idea for living. And what a wonderful message in, in all terms. But I think we need to really address it behooves people like you and me, right? Who understand that, who've got the adrenaline and the cause and the energy and the, and the striving to bring kindness and joy to other people in the world and empower others. We realize that, you know, on our own, we can have all those cash and prizes and sitting around with a stack of $10,000 bills lying on my Bugatti and posting it on social media is clearly meaningless. And what I've found over the last number of 18 months, to be honest, one of the reasons I embarked on the financial literacy thing is we haven't heard about all the other people who got sheltered in place, lost their jobs, jobs have struggled as I struggled with, with, with uh, COVID, right? There are, uh, you know, we, we know we've lost, unfortunately, 800,000 souls in the United States, but we've got 3 million plus people whose lives have been impacted plus uh, 
by this virus, by this disease, by being sheltered in place, by the spiritual, psychological, financial challenges that have come across our desk over the last 18 months. And so I think it behooves people like you and me to take this time more than ever to really accept the fact that we can't imagine what people are going through, right? We're hearing about all the people who are doing great. And we're not hearing about those who, you know, who are lying still at home, having lost their jobs, having lost a loved one, you know, went to Thanksgiving dinner and there are people missing at their dinner table, or who have just gone through the fact that they've been isolated. You know, isolation is a, is a powerful thing, right? We do it to ourselves often when we're in a dark spot, but there are people who are alone, who we don't hear from. You know, we always talk about it. I talk about it in different programs that I work with to try and empower people is when you need help, you need to ask for help. And as you and I know, sometimes when you're in those darkest moments, you don't ask for help, you isolate, you lock yourself in and things only get darker. So the, the, the Surgeon General did say, we're about to embark on a, you know, when, when we start coming out of this pandemic, we're going to see the sort of like, when the tide goes out, you know, the fish start to stink. We're gonna see the unfortunate uh, uh, collateral damage that the last 18 months has done to people's spirits. And I think, you know, one of the things that have held our spirits high is the success of our financial well-being in the United States, especially the financial well-being in the stock market, the financial well-being in crypto, the financial well-being in NFTs. And, you know, you know and I know that we both have studied history for one reason, that human nature never changes. And part of your mission in the financial literacy is to allow people to make good decisions because we're not hearing the right data. And we have opened this market up in a very short amount of time to neophytes uh, that are blowing up their accounts. They're losing everything that they have. And meanwhile, everyone in the mass public thinks that everybody is getting rich. Everyone's finding gold and they're following basic advice, basic statistics and data that just is not true and also very, very detrimental. And if things, you know, interest rates rise and the economy slows down and not only are we, you know, isolated, but we don't have that false sense of security of financial security, we could really have an exponential pandemic of depression, anxiety, suicide, things like that. So what you do is so important. What are some of the things that you've seen You've been on the market for over 34 years. What are some of the things that you see in the general investor, the new investor, that you give them advice and say, hold on a second, let me explain how Robinhood works or you know, Reddit works or you know, some of these crypto things going on. You, you may wanna consider this. What are some of those things we should be considering? So look, you know, we have, what, what, look, one of the reasons historically on the stock market, we had what was called accredited investor like your father and your grandfather, if they were invested in the stock market and they wanted to open up an account and they I, went- I'm to actually old enough where I had to be accredited in my 20s. So I get Exactly. <laughs> I, I'm, still, I'm still not accredited, but it's all fine and good. But to be a accredited investor, which was all the barriers to entry for the general population, if you invested in the stock market, actually, as we look back on the last 18 months and think about it, it was actually for a good reason. What did it mean? That meant that if I tried to open an account with a regular brokerage firm, they said to, they wanted to know my financial situation and they wanted to know that the money that I was willing to invest, if lost 100% of, would have no effect on my standard of living over the next five years. Not that many people could say that. Um, very wealthy millionaires who invested $100,000 in the stock market may be able to say that. But virtually everyone else who was living on a paycheck could ever say that. The good part of what's happened over the last bunch of years is uh, since the 18 months, since Robin Hood, since the pandemic, and I call it sort of a perfect storm in a good way and in a bad way, is what I call the democratization uh, of the investment and trading community. Everybody with 10 bucks in a cell phone can now invest in the stock market. It's just the way it is. All the barriers to entry have been down. But as I've described to you before, and I think we talked about it a little bit, if I was out there trying to learn to be a pilot, I wouldn't just read a book, hop on a, grab the keys to the plane, hop on a plane and fly across the ocean. Same thing with money. Just because I can put $10 in an account and, and, and get leverage 100 to one, doesn't mean I'm actually uh, prepared to trade a market where I could lose everything. And so, you know, I've, I've, I've been, I'm amazed 
that the fact that the Robin Hoods of the world, anyone who doesn't know it, there have been these trading apps that have sort of come out since the pandemic. They've offered trading for free to virtually anybody who wants to put 10 bucks in and has a smartphone. Uh, they're not giving them any of the information that, you know what, guys, you may take your make your $100 become 5000 and just as easily that 5000 could become zero. And if you're actually not watching what's going on, that 5000 can become negative 3000 right? And there was the unfortunate story of the young man who on Robin Hood lost everything and ended up committing suicide. So it behooves somebody like me who's been a long timer. I don't like to refer myself as an old timer. A long timer. I've been here a long time. I did go to high school with Alexander Hamilton, but that's another <laughs> story. Um, is to learn that this isn't a get rich quick scheme. You know, that now that you've been invited to this party, and I love the fact, look, a lot of people in my situation are not embracing this young community because they look at them as the guys who sort of attack the GameStop and the Reddit thing and the Wall Street bets and whatnot. And I've realized, although I wasn't clear about that motivation in the beginning of this new community that would sort of attack stocks and whatever, and I have no ax to grind on that. I don't side with the Citadels or the Robin Hoods or anything like that. I don't. That's. That's not a battle I choose to think. I am. I really want to, now that all of these new young retail traders have been invited to this party, I want them to be successful. And the bottom line is we're hearing about the few successes. We're not hearing about those who lost. And there are certain rules of the game, right? That you that no one got broke taking a profit. Never turn a winning trade into a losing trade. You know, that diamond hands is a misnomer. That you're, listen, it's like this. It's like, you know, if you get sick, and you want some advice, you go to the best doctor you can find, right? Some people will, if they don't get the answer they want, they'll go to find, go to a doctor enough times till they find one who gives them the answer they wanna hear. Some people take their medical advice from the internet. Can you imagine 40 million new young people are taking financial advice from someone who does not have their best interest involved, whose motivation is nothing more than to create hype and FOMO, fear of missing out. And what ends up happening there is, and I analyze it on a regular basis, that a majority of the volume in these stocks that have gone up hundreds of percent, the volume is at the high price of the stock. So 90% of the people who are trading these stocks, and if your community knows them, whether it's the DWAC, that was one of those facts that Trump had, or CAR that went from 150 to 550, or the game stops that went from two to 483, and right back down to 151 is, Stocks that go up for no reason can come down for no reason, right? And that, you know, if, if you're on the internet and everyone's telling you it's going to the moon and, uh, you know, and it's going to a thousand and never worry about it, there's no, there's no uh, glory in losing money. There isn't. And, you know, there's actually a thing called lost porn, right, that's on the internet. So I think the great benefit of letting everyone in, I think, is wonderful. The barriers to entry are down. Everyone can come to this party. But my fear is that some people will come to the party, not know that one drink is fine and 10 drinks is too much. They end up sitting out, you know, throwing up on the side of the street. They blame the suits. They blame the suits for having not told them that, you know, nine tequilas may not be a great idea. Same thing with the market. I'm here to tell them that this is a powerful game. Money is a funny thing. The internet does not have your best interest in, in heart. And that it, if learned, if you got by the toolbox and fill it with the right tools, you can be profitable and enjoy this party that you've been invited to after all these years. And what an amazing opportunity now that we are sheltered in place. Maybe people have a little money in their pocket to trade, but this is the real deal. It's not gambling unless you don't know what you're doing. Otherwise, you're just throwing a dart at a wall. You may try hit a home run once or twice. Eventually, you're going to go to the well one too many times and give it all back. And you talked about that toolbox uh, and, you know, for me, when you have the appropriate tools, volatility like we have today in a market can be a great thing. What are some of the tools that you teach? What are some of the tools that you utilize that can help our community really take advantage of the volatility of the market, not get crushed? Okay, so I have partnered up with a gentleman named David Green. I've known for 35 years. I am the motivator in chief. I am the one who offers inspiration. He's really the educator. He's a technician, right? And together when the pandemic hit and we saw March 2020 come around and we saw, you know, TD Ameritrade announced there were 40 million new retail traders in the market. We realized that we know, we've seen this movie before 
and we know this is not a get rich quick scheme and that where our fear was that everyone would come to this party and most of them would get really badly hurt. So there is a thing called technical analysis. It's been around forever. We didn't invent it, but we've tried to make it simple. You know how we, they, they had came up with those books, the, the dummy trading for dummies almost, right? Not to be disrespectful in any way, but actually trading successfully is simple. We want to put the probability in your favor that you're going to win more times than you lose. And the stock market, amazingly enough, has given us tools, one of them being stop orders, risk management, where you're able to actually isolate how much you're willing to lose in a trade and how much you can benefit the best from your winners. And that's one of the things. Technical analysis is basically charting using historic data, some moving averages, some lines. I know there are a million people out there who teach it and put hundreds of lines in, you know, and their graphs look like an air traffic controller and that they don't get it. It's completely confusing. We try and keep it super simple. And so we, we have a course called Wall Street Global Trading Academy. We do live free webinars to try and keep and entice people to learn the game. We do offer a course that's out there if anyone's interested in buying it. One of our differentiators is we mentor and coach people like you do. You know, it's kind of funny. There are people who just sort of throw courses out there to teach you about motivation, about crypto, about investing, about any number of things, but everybody learns in a different way. What we want to do is we want to give you the information and then we want to coach you and hold your hand until you get it. And so that's what we do. Everybody who buys our course gets to uh, come on with us every Thursday night, ask us those questions that, you know, when they come to a stumbling block, when they get a, a, uh, a pebble in their shoe and they just can't figure something out, you know, we always say the only, there are no stupid questions. The only one that's stupid is the one you don't ask. So we give everyone that opportunity to really uh, learn to the best, be their best self. You know, and it goes back to our, our spiritual discussion, you know, that for me, and it's not my line at all, but if you find something you love to do, you'll never work a day in your life. So one of the reasons I share all this stuff is I found something I love. It's, it's the human element of what I do here at the Stock Exchange. Social media has brought me this a wonderful community that I can inspire and motivate to do this. But all that falls by the wayside if people are losing. You know, and uh, I mean, I watched this, this gentleman on Instagram named Charlie, you know, you know who Charlie is, I would imagine. Right. And it was funny because he was having a weight issue and um, and he kept talking about I can't lose weight. I can't lose weight. And uh, and DJ Khaled, apparently he had a meeting with DJ Khaled. And he said, you're you're using the wrong words. You're looking at it the wrong way. Right. You're shedding weight. You're not losing weight. If you think of yourself as a loser in any way, that psychology can be problematic. So, you know, psychology, one of the things we also treat, teach in the course is that a, most of our biggest problems, and you share this and teach it every day, is between our ears, right? It's what we think. It's the noise in our head. It's things that rent space in our head that are could be negativity, right? Could be fear, right? It could be any number of things that really stop us from getting up every morning fresh and approaching the day, whether things are good or whether things are bad, you know, if you're if you're inundated by negativity and fear and, and illness of any kind, you know, and you lie there under the covers, no, no positivity is going to come and find you under the covers. You know, I wanted to share this one story um, that I had a, a sort of a challenging time around 2007, where the business on the stock exchange completely changed. I had been very successful at a really big business. And then we started with the electronic trading. And so the human element was a little bit being dragged out of the market. That was one of my fortes. I was good with people. I was good with numbers. I had a wonderful community around. And you know what? And I lost a lot of my business. And you know, I had two choices. I could stay at home, lick my wounds, and try and figure out what was going on. And you know, I had listened to teachers like it was before I met you, but I had listened to spiritual teachers who said no, nothing good is going to find you lying at home in your bed in a dark room, being really depressed. Get up and go to work. If you got to fake it till you make it, just do it. And for two years, I went to work every day. And I didn't tell people I was not making any money. I went to work. And even if I didn't have a customer on the phone, I was talking on the phone as if I was acting as if that things were going to be okay. And eventually they did. You know, I ran into a gentleman who's still my very close friend on the subway. I'd known him years back. We chatted and I said, you know, he goes, you look, yeah, you, are you struggling? You're making money? And I said, you know, I'm not. And he goes, well, how about we do business together? And that started 
me back in my career. And I was able, I, I was able to flourish once again. That's one of your messages. I know that. Yeah, well, nothing like the law of Goya. Get off your ass, as Peter Tuckman has. But what makes him such a phenomenal mensch, what makes him such a phenomenal course and trainer is that he is not only a mentor sharing his experience, a wealth of knowledge, of situational knowledge, but also a coach to bring the best out of you and a phenomenal teacher, utilizing great stories to teach the lessons that can allow us all to expand, grow, and accelerate. There is no doubt why they call him, not just because he looks like it, <laughs> the Einstein of Wall Street, the most iconic stockbroker on the New York Stock Exchange, someone who I am honored to call my friend, Peter Tuckman. Thank you for joining me.